This week's episode of the Autoblog Podcast is brought to you by the Autoblog Daily Digest. It's a great way to stay updated with what's happening in the world of cars in just two or three minutes every day. Ask your smart speaker for the Autoblog Daily Digest to stay up to speed with the latest car news, or subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to the Autoblog Podcast. I'm Greg Migliori. Joining me today is Road Test Editor Zach Palmer. What's going on, man? Oh, the noises of lawnmowers and uh, the occasional cicada, you know, the sounds of a happening spring. That's what's going on. How are you doing? I am super psyched. I spent um, a week recently in the GTI. I think you spent a week recently in the Golf R. So, some of the recent podcasts we've been talking about very important things like minivans and electric cars, always important, always fun. But if you're a hardcore enthusiast, this is probably what you're here for right now is to talk about the Golf R and the GTI. So, um, yeah, man, I'm excited. It'll be a good show. And I've had a lot Me of too. fun in these, in these Volkswagens. So, hot hatch time. Hot I'm hatch time. Too. I'll talk about some other things though. Uh, the Mazda 6. And the CX-3 are done. Uh, we've got a little bit of uh, just some rumors about what's going on with Alfa Romeo. Maybe the Duetto is coming back, and the GTV. Sign me up for that. Uh, electric news out of Bronco, Beyond the Lightning. Stay with us. Uh, Zach did some reporting on what's going on with the EV Bronco and Explorer. Uh, we'll also talk about the, uh, the Pro, the, light, the Lightning's like work truck version, the base one. Uh, this is the one that I think... They talked about was going to start around $39,000. This is the truck you'll get for that sort of low, low price. Got a mailbag question. We'll spend some money. We'll talk about Zach's column from, uh, about, uh, from last week. So, we'll get into that in a little bit. You may have noticed we've been doing some columns and opinion pieces on site. Uh, whenever we have the author, if you will, of the piece on the podcast, we like to talk about it. So, uh, he's going to talk about adaptive headlights which is a subject I think is kind of interesting. I, I've seen some of these technologies in Europe. I saw what BMW was working on about 10 years ago now. Still haven't seen it here in the United States, but I think I don't want to spoil the show. I think Zach's got a take on that. So, Golf R, GTI. We'll just pretend to open a beer here. I would open one, but it's 2 o'clock and I still need a little bit of my caffeine drip going, but two guys at the bar talking about hot hatches. Um, to start things off, I really thought the GTI, and I, I wrote this in my story, is like exactly what I expected. Straight out of central casting. Um, they dressed it up a little bit. There's like even more LED lights. They kind of, you know, did some interesting things with like the front diffuser. Um, so it's a little more, I don't know, things are moved around a little bit. But if you saw it from the curb, you'd say, yeah, that's a GTI. It's got a little bit more power. It's the inside is the best way to put it is they kind of stole some stuff from the ID4, dressed up the inside. Um, limited slip is now standard. Uh, you get a diff on it. Uh, so that's kind of cool. And that's about it. It's a turbo four with a six speed manual. Dual clutch is optional. Current car, uh, I believe the manual take rate is only about 40%. I was actually surprised to hear that. I thought it would have been a little bit higher. But 40% is a huge number when you think about it for a manual transmission car. Um, so, overall, I was psyched to drive this. I'm a big fan of the GTI. There have been some like newcomers in the hatch segment. I was going to say hot hatch and tripped over it there. But whether you want like a medium spicy or a true hot hatch, like, you know, maybe the Veloster N or something like that, uh, you can kind of go up and down the food chain. But for me, this is like simple, pure just enough power. It's pretty light. Uh, for me, this was like, you know, straight up what I was looking for. So, I'm curious, what'd you think of the Golf R? Yeah. You know, sort of just how, how you let off there. You know, it, the car is exactly what you expected it to be. Um, you know, from, from like a, a big picture area, you know, the, the Golf R is still a Golf R. You know, it's still that all-wheel drive, hot hatch, with more power than you were expecting, that you can show up anywhere in, look professional, uh, be this very 
very mature car, but then take it out on the weekend and have a ridiculously good time with it. Um, and that, that second weekend part that I just described there is actually uh, where this car's biggest change and biggest improvement is. And I just think it's a lot more fun than the previous Golf R. Um, you know, the, the old Golf R had a pretty, you know, standard Haldex all-wheel drive system on it that, uh, you know, is akin to a lot of things that you got in a standard crossover. Granted, there was brake-based torque vectoring, but there was no proper torque, like real torque vectoring like you got in a Focus RS um, or a, a Super WRX STI. Um, the all-wheel drive system was sort of along for the ride, but not like adding a lot of fun to it. This time, this Golf R, I think, is a ton of fun because they added that, that uh, torque vectoring uh, di differential on the rear axle. And uh, yeah, it works. It has a proper drift mode. You go in there, you know, you, you slot it into race. There's a Nürburgring mode. There's a drift mode, uh, which, is, which is pretty neat. And um, I actually went and tried it out in some abandoned parking lot. And it works, uh, just like the Focus RS. Um, you know, you, you smash the gas pedal and all of a sudden your front wheel drive based hot hatch is sliding sideways like a rear wheel drive car, um, which is wildly, wildly cool. Um, so that to me is like the biggest, biggest difference of what makes this, this golf R so much better than the last one. Granted, there's more horsepower. You have 315 horsepower now, as opposed to 200 and just, just over 280 before thing is very, very fast. I know that yours, you, yours had the manual, mine mm -hmm. had the DSG, uh, that Volkswagen's dual clutch automatic is, is brilliant. Uh, it's still brilliant here. There's a proper launch control. This thing, honestly, you know, if, if I'm going to butt dyno it, it felt quicker. It, it felt closer to four flat than the, you know, just about four and a half, 4.6 that Volkswagen estimates. Yeah. So, you know, for what you're going to get for this car, I mean, th th this car is going to cost just over around $40,000 would be my guess to start. Um, you know, you're getting a lot, a lot of car here. And if, if you're not, you know, if you're the kind of person that, you know, doesn't want to be seen driving around something like the Civic Type R, which is, you know, full boy racer, uh, wings everywhere, scoops, vents, the whole deal. Um, you can have, you know, close to, if not just as much fun in, in this Golf R now, uh, with, with the changes they've made. So I, I hope that, that the GTI you drove is, is just as much fun. I mean, I, I, I know every GTI that I've, I've driven in the past has been a blast to drive. You know, when you really cane them, when you really start to get on them, uh, it is, you know, there's a reason why it's always been the standard of, of, of hot hatches out there. So from, from what you're saying, it sounds like it could still be that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I literally, I, the only thing I sometimes am, slightly reticent to label it and this is maybe just the way the industry has changed is is it really a hot hatch anymore i almost call it like yeah. a medium spicy hatch in the which is a cliche but in the broader context of like the type r or you know some of the like the veloster m so um in the golf r of course but yeah. it's a riot to drive i mean to me what's great about the gti and i've been driving gtis when i when I first got into the business, I had never driven a GTI until I had gotten into press cars. And, you know, early 20s, I'm like, wow, I've heard about this car. This is amazing. And you like immediately, you can feel comfortable in it, not intimidated, and have a riot when you want to. But if it's like just a normal drive, you can do that too. You know, maybe have a couple aggressive, you know, launches from stoplights or you're like me and you like to cut down this kind of wooded path, good times. You want to ring it out, you can do that too. You want to just literally chill that, hey, you're just driving a Volkswagen hatchback. And I think that's the really, the beauty of the GTI is it, it has really all the capability you need for like a daily driving performance thing uh, as far as just like performance. But it you know, it could be docile. It could be like just agreeable. It could be whatever you want it to be. Um, and it's just that balance is 
is really good. And I think when you want it to be really get on it, you can feel the torque steer, just the shifting is spot on. You know, that clutch in that car is, I mean, I, there's very, there's like probably a list of maybe five or six manual gearboxes that I truly enjoy. And like the one in the GTI has always been one of them. Um, the one thing they updated the shifter. I, I kind of like the Mark uh, Seven generation, which was a little more like analog looking, if you will. Whereas now it's kind of like a little more, almost like a mouse on the top of it, if you will, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, this is the car. I would take a GTI over the Golf R, over um, really almost anything else in this segment. I think the Type R is awesome, but it's not something I would necessarily want to live with. And I like just the golfiness and the Volkswageniness of the GTI as opposed to like just some of the other things out there. I would take this over when the Focus RS was still a thing, um, which, you know, to your point earlier, that all wheel drive system, that was really a trick system that Ford had in the Focus RS. And you don't see that many places these days. Um, so I'm I'm heartened to hear that the Golf R really is like has this robust system. Um, but yeah, I mean, it sounds like yeah. we're pretty much on the same page here with these cars. Yeah, you know. So the, the the one thing that was honestly annoying me the most about this car, and I'll be curious to hear if it was annoying you too, was a lot of the the design on the interior and how they executed the technology within. Um, the fact that, you know, Volkswagens have always been pretty simple in that there are these very big knobs, easily, you know, easily reached buttons and just, you know, it's, it's a general like user friendly interface, easy to use. Um, however, with the market golf, they've really, just like you said, they've steal a lot from the ID4, which is this very tech forward, um, you know, touch screen, touch haptic, festooned dash. Um, and it's, it's very different from what I'm, I'm used to in Volkswagens of the past. And I found myself constantly being annoyed by the, the little volume slider to change the volume. Like it's, there's no knob anymore. Um, and the climate controls were adjusted by this also like a little touch haptic thing on there. And Honestly, I, I, I found myself, I kept accidentally hitting the volume or the climate control while I'm trying to play with the touch screen. Um, I, I don't really have any problems with, with the touch screen itself. Um, that, that worked really quickly and super smooth. Um, but just some, some of the other like, small execution areas and like where they place some of the buttons in that they're all touch haptic. So if you accidentally like brush up against one, all of a sudden you're bringing up an entirely different screen um, and you're like, oh, you know, and you're trying to go 50 miles an hour down, down the road. And it's like, ah, I can't even adjust my volume um, because it's, it's pretty annoying that way. Um, now, that said, I still really like the way the interior looks. Uh, I know that the Golf R that, that I had was full of all the, the, the classic blue accents, you know, a lot of suede on the seats, just really interesting trim in general. Um, but I am curious to see if you had, you know, similar thoughts on the usability and just a sort of a, a different approach that Volkswagen seemed to, to take to the interior in general. Yeah, I would say it was like a whiff or a riff on the ID4 uh, as far as the execution in the Golf uh, GTI. It just... You know, I found it a little more cumbersome because, you know, the old Golf, just all trim levels were, it was so like just basic and simple and intuitive. You know, it's a little, I would say almost unsettling to have, you know, that much of your attention, perhaps, dare I use the word distracted by the infotainment, you know, like it's a little more work that I cared to put into it. Now, the ID4 that I drove a couple months ago, Maybe I'm giving it a pass because it's an EV and you sort of expect the EV to have the futuristic thing. Um, but, you know, I mean, infotainment is infotainment. So, I don't know. This was a little bit more than I wanted in the GTI, but I mean, I could live with it. It wouldn't stop me from buying the car. Let me put it that way. And it, um, it was okay. It was easy enough to figure out. Um, but so it goes. You know, it wasn't my... 
it wouldn't be a deal breaker, but I wouldn't say it's a total asset. You know, like they're billing yeah. this as like the digital GTI. And I think you've got to do that. You know, you can't like basically kill the golf in the United States and then only bring the golf R and the GTI and say we're making these like sort of niche performance machines towards enthusiasts and then just roll out the ball like it's 2012 again. Like you got to do some of this stuff. But, you know, I, I was just very meh on the execution, you know, it yeah. looks okay, but it's a little it bit does. of a pain to use. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I definitely like the way that, you know, somebody like Audi executes on yeah. a lot of their touch controls better than the way this was. But yeah. ju just like you were saying, would it stop me from actually buying the car? Uh, no, the car is still brilliant to drive and it's, it, it's, it's a ton of fun. Yeah. So, yeah. This yeah. is a riff on their MIB three, I want to say like infotainment, uh, electronic architecture and, you know, I don't know. I think they're still, they're still wrenching on that one, if you will, to get it totally yeah. good. Um, <laughs> yep. Yep. So I, I wouldn't doubt it. <laughs> these were European spec cars, which is kind of cool. So when you're, if you're listening to this, let's say it's Memorial Day weekend, which, oh, hey, wait, it is. Maybe you're grilling some hot dogs. You got a can of beer on the patio. You're walking the dog. If it's not too hot, um, you're probably wondering where the heck are these stories. So, my story is probably going to run on Tuesday. So, look for it. Um, I guess that's June 1st, right? And then Zach has the Golf R. We're looking to schedule that one out probably on Wednesday. So, if you're listening to this, you know, as soon as perhaps Friday for the weekend, Come back next week. We'll have both these reviews up. Um, and they should be pretty, pretty good. We're calling them first drives because they are, uh, but they're definitely first drives. These are like European spec. Uh, mine was actually a German car, I think. I imagine yours was probably as well. Uh, it was, yeah. So, yeah. So it was cool to drive them. One thing I don't know about your car, mine had like normal, like I guess it's the beauty of digital, is it had just everything was in miles. It was all calibrated. You know, sometimes you get like a European spec car and it's in kilometers and you're like, okay, great. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, thankfully all, all of that was set to our U S units of measurement. Yeah. Um, no, the, the weirdest thing about, you know, because, because we've driven a few of these European spec cars and it's actually foreshadowing, uh, the discussion about the adaptive lights that we'll have mm -hmm. later. Um, but, you know, the the biggest weird things you'll find there is like the navigation doesn't work. Yeah. The radio doesn't work. Uh, and then I know on, on the front of mine, they actually had a German Deutschland license plate. Yeah, mine too. Um, which, you know, you, you, you sort of see that, you know, from, you know, somebody who's like a German car enthusiast. That's a, a modification sometimes. Uh, and it, it was just sort of neat to drive around. Um, with that plate and a car that, well, nobody else in the U S has, has, has been able to drive yet. It so, is a, yeah. um, that's a modification. If I were to get the GTI, I would get one of those European plates in front. The German <laughs> ones look good cause they're like long rectangular. You get the, you know, they're like six or seven letters and numbers. It's, it's a really good look on a GTI or a golf R. Um, so we don't have the actual specs out, but, one of the things you could, you know, just read in our stories is like some of our estimates, if you will. Um, I'm guessing that zero to 60 in my, my GTI, if you will, is about four, five, four to five, five, somewhere in there. So pretty quick. Uh, we got a little bit more horsepower in the GTI this year, a little bit more torque, uh, 241 and 273. Uh, that's the, I think it's the EA like 0888 or something like that in Volkswagen parlance. That's the code name to the four cylinder. Um, you know, curb weight, I think they're going to go up a little bit. I estimated about 3,200 uh, on the GTI and that's like, like very close to where it is now. Um, stuff like that. Uh, mine, so the Golf R probably 41 starting. It's a pretty good deal for all the car you get. The one I tested, the GTI, was it was like an SE trim, but it had some stuff on it. It had DCC, it had the bigger touchscreen in the middle, 10.25 inches, or I think it was 10 inches, and the base one's like 8.25. So it had some stuff on it, if you will. But again, it's a German car, there was no Monroney, anything like that. 
So mine kind of sketching this was about 38 grand. And one of the points I would make is 38 grand is almost exactly the average cost of a new vehicle in the United States, um, perhaps pre COVID or something. But I mean, that's like the number we would generally use as like sort of the equator of um, car buying. Uh, I've heard it's bumped up maybe to around 41, which puts it right into your Gulf R territory. But for me, that's about a good, it's a good investment if you're an enthusiast, you know, like you 38 grand, you're, you're working, you know, you want to spend some money, but you don't want to spend a ton of money. It's a good investment is what I would say. And you'll always be able to resell your GTI. So, um, and then the base car, uh, currently is like 29 before like title destination, all that good stuff. So really you're talking probably closer to 31. Um, let's assume for the new model year, it kind of goes up to more like 32, 33, you know, it's totally reasonable. I've always liked the GTI and it's very base trim too, though, just because like, there's just like the beauty of all the stuff you could get on like a 29.9, like SE GTI and all the fun you can have, you know, again, it was just a beautiful thing. So I, I think the value proposition is really still there. For these cars yeah yeah no i mean if you can get one you know right around the same base price which i suspect you will be able to get one around 30 yeah. when they do come out here and if you get the manual and relatively sparsely equipped you know that that still feels like a really really good deal to me when it does approach forty thousand dollars is when it starts to feel like wow i'm getting really close to golf our territory yeah i could have all-wheel drive could have another 60 70 horsepower um and yeah then then it does start to get tricky like do i want uh do i want this gti maybe i could even buy a civic type r for like 38 grand you know that's that starts to get pretty tough honestly um the i've always had a bit of an issue with the golf r's price because it has been so expensive forty thousand plus upwards of like 42 43 if you throw some options and 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 the dsg on there and the all-wheel drive system has never been what feels like a forty plus thousand dollar all wheel drive system. Agreed. But this one finally does. Mm, and this okay. time I can I, I can finally say that, you know, e, e, when you buy this forty one thousand dollar golf, you know, you are getting an all wheel drive system that is going to make you happy. You know, I I, I can compare it in a way to the uh, Mercedes AMG CLA forty five's all wheel drive system and that the car feels way more tail happy in rear drive than it probably should, which which is cool. Which is why I've always, you know, fixes that issue. So if if you didn't like the Golf R before, I'd say this is this is a definite sign to go give it another try. Uh, if if that's in your price range, I would absolutely love to get either one of these cars on a track. I think it would be an absolute riot. I the one thing I've somewhat, you know, I've I've basically been making the case for the GTI for this whole so, whole show so far. But on a track, it's really tough to beat a Golf R. You know, it's just like the all-wheel drive. I tend to... I You can get a manual with a Golf R, but I tend to associate that car with the dual clutch. That just feels to me more like the Golf R experience. And that's my own impressions. I don't know. I mean, you can get whatever you want. But to me, that's more like the experience. And then the GTI is more... You go with the manual... Even though the, the dual clutch is great in the, the GTI as well, but I would love to get the Golf R on a track. It kind of takes some of the thinking out for you, a little bit more technical, like with this new all wheel drive system, get the dual clutch and then really try to make some nice lines with that. No, I it would be a lot of fun on, on a track. I can already tell that the torque vectoring would be uh, just perfect, absolutely perfect because it, it, it really really does help you uh, when you're on the road and cornering. I can, it's only going to be exaggerated when you're on a track. I did take the Mark 7 GTI on Gingerman, which is a track here in Michigan, for those of you who know, you know, tracks. It was pretty fun. Uh, that's a good track for it too, because you can, you know, frankly, miss some shifts and just kind of like, you know, get on the throttle and let the revs build and so it goes. But if I run, I don't know, Monticello, give me the, uh, give me the Golf R or maybe an <laughs> M3. But uh, we should probably talk some news. Uh, yeah. Let's run. News time. Yeah. News time. 
Mazda 6. This is one of our favorite cars. We were just talking about this when I was, I had driven the Accord and the Camry. We were trying to rate some of these, you know, the midsize sedan segments. And we're like, well, hmm, you know, the Mazda 6, we've always given that an editor's pick. Now, what about the Sonata? Or, you know, what, you know, what do we do? You know, we give this many editors picks. Well, we don't have that problem anymore. It sounds like at least after this model year, uh, really sad to see this car go. The other part of the news here was that the CX-3 is done, which is no surprise to anyone. They added the CX-30 and you don't need two vehicles that are very similar in mission. Uh, but for me, the, the headliner here is that one of the better midsize sedans is, is done after this model year. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it it is sad because you know this, the Mazda six and the Honda Accord have always been my my two favorites out there, and the, the Mazda six arguably is the best driving midsize sedan, um, which makes us extra sad for enthusiasts who like this car. Um, I I've recommended this car to so many people. I've had a few people take my word for it and buy it. Um, you know, it is. It's a really, really good sedan, but Mazda is probably discontinuing this. Uh, you know, if if I had to make a guess, hopefully to make room for a new midsize sedan coming down the line that uh, it has been rumored and reported to be a rear-wheel drive-based sedan with an inline six. Um, and maybe it's not called the Mazda six. Maybe it is called the Mazda six. Um, but regardless, if we get that, um, you know, maybe a year or two from now, this will make the Mazda 6's passing much more palatable and uh, much less sad. Um, now, obviously, there's always the chance that Mazda decides, oh, this is a sedan. Uh, maybe the U.S. market doesn't want it because apparently everybody wants to buy a crossover these days. Um, that would be unfortunate, but uh, no, we'll... We'll see. I mean, I you, you can always count on Mazda. To, you can always count on them to come out with something you know interesting and fun to drive for us. Um, so it'll it'll be sad to see this one go, but hopefully, what comes next will be even better. I think if they can follow through on that strategy, then that's a trade I would make. You know, because the Mazda Six is a great driving sedan. It looks great. Uh, amazing chassis, steering is good, but it is a front-wheel drive-based car. And if you're telling me, hey, I can get a rear-wheel drive-based car that's a true sports sedan, okay, you make that trade because the 6 as it is, is about as good as a mainstream mid-size sedan could be. But if you're going to give me an enthusiast mid-size sedan, sign me up for that. And I think they could really, like if there's a company that could do that, it's them, you know, them or Genesis. Genesis is the only other company that I think is really diving into sedans, performance oriented with gusto, you know. So, yeah, if anybody could do it, it's Mazda. Yeah, and it's going to be really nice. You know, they're always going for the, you know, premium plus segments out there. So, you know, the interior is going to be much more luxurious than you might expect. Uh, it's probably going to way undercut. European competition as far as the price goes. Um, we just have to wait for it and just hope that it actually happens. <laughs> yeah. I hope so. <laughs> so, since we're going down uh, like just fantasy car options, Alpha is talking about reviving the GTV and the Duetto. I mean, that's, you know, you're talking like really fantasy football here at this point, you know, as far as like, you know, just great things that we would love to see. Um, but the CEO of Alpha um, made these comments and Ronan Glon, one of our European freelancers, has reported on them. Check out that story. Uh, basically, what he's saying is, is there probably are other priorities now, but these are two nameplates they could look to revive as they fill out the Alpha Romeo lineup. And I, I think, you know, sure, you want to bring these back. I love it. That's a great idea. That's almost like, you know, if Chevy were, were to say, hey, we're going to bring back a rear wheel drive Impala, 
You guys good with that? <laughs> sure. Yes, please do. Like, you know, when Dodge brought back the Charger, there were too many people who said, eh, no, 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 I don't want to do that. You know, like this is playing right to the base. I mean, I, I would say who knows if they're going to actually do either of these. Um, I actually think the duetto makes a fair amount of sense for them because you're Alfa Romeo. You want to have like a sporty little convertible, you know, you want to have something that really reinforces who you are as like a luxurious Italian sporting brand. You're not Maserati, you're not Ferrari, but you're also not just, you know, random sort of premium mark that's lumped in there with Buick and Infiniti and all these other brands. Like you really want to steer into your heritage. So using names like this can help. I mean, Lincoln has done it to great effect. So. I mean, this is promising to see, but I'm I'm not going to sign out a mortgage on this, you know, <laughs> this rumor. But we'll see. <laughs> yeah, no. I so I actually saw a duetto. I think it was two days ago. Yeah. Uh, some some guy cruising around with the top down. Pe- beautiful weather out here. Uh, he was definitely having a really really great time. Um, I mean the sort of the modern equivalent of that, you know, that, that we've had up until the the past year or two has been the uh, Fiat 124 Spider. You know, we have had an Italian convertible that's fun to drive, that's interesting. Um, however, Fiat just, just discontinued that. Um, so, we no longer have that. You know, would it be really awesome if Alfa Romeo did something, you know, actually made a proper like small convertible uh, luxury sports thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I would, I would love that. I would, I would triumph it like crazy. Is it what I think that Alfa Romeo needs to be like super relevant and bring themselves to, you know, some greater sales success or, you know, just general success in the U.S.? Eh, maybe not. I mean, it's it, it, it's going to be a low volume something or other that uh, you know, and it it, it 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 sort of depends how how you go about it. Like, is it going to be a halo car? Like, is it going to be this really like big, expensive, like hundred thousand dollar luxury convertible, or is it going to sort of be like the original Duetto and be this you know sort of small, cheaper, uh, fun little sports convertible? Um. Obviously, that didn't really work that well when it was badged as a Fiat because it doesn't exist anymore. Um, but, you know, obviously, I wouldn't uh, say that Alfa Romeo can't do it because it would it would get a lot of praise and it would probably be a lot of fun. As, as for the GTV, um, you know, that sort of speaks to my desire for wanting a Julia Coupe. Um, I mean, that, that, that car is so, so much fun. And, you know, I you look at the other... Cars that are out there, you know, you can get a 4 Series, that's a coupe. You can get a C-Class coupe. You can get an Audi A5 coupe. You know, if 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 Alfa, if, yeah, if they did that, made sort of a Julia coupe or maybe, you know, something like a Julia coupe and called it a GTV, it seems like there's a space for it to fit in. Um, you know, it's, it, it's not, once again, it's not going to be this crazy hot selling anything because it's, it's not a crossover like the tonale that is coming that is going to you know going to be that car that can hopefully push alfa romeo forward into the u.s with with more volume and more relevance um but something like a gtv slash julia coupe sounds right up my alley for something that can be fun out there and do a quadrifoglio version too throw that throw that big 2.9 liter twin turbo v6 in there make it sound like a ferrari make it awesome it's a ferrari engine that's right Yep, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, 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 there's there's a whole lot of potential for extremely cool things here. Um, and it sounds like the Alfa Romeo CEO is, you know, not necessarily close to the idea either, which, you know, you, you love to see with such a storied brand like Alfa that has this heritage to pull from. Will they do it though? I also share your doubts. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of different, you know, things that could get in the way of this. Uh, at different points, the GTV and the Spider were uh, sort of related in the 90s. Going farther back, the GTV name was actually used on uh, on the Julia. So um, I could definitely see them, you know, 
sort of hedging or doing something like, hey, we said we'd bring back the GTV, but it's a version of the, the Julia, which I don't think, I mean, reading between the lines here, the alpha boss here is kind of aiming for something like a little more ambitious, like separate model lines, uh, which I think would be the way to go. Uh, it's just, he's sort of, uh, and I love it when brands do this, whether it's in cars or sports, they sort of take a chapter of their history then try to make it something that fits the modern time. And that's great because as enthusiasts, we get to buy into this modern thing that is like what it used to be. But then sometimes it's like, it's not exactly what it used to be. You know what I mean? Like, what is the GTV in 2025 really going to be? You know, uh, but there's a couple chapters they could pull from. So that's, that's exciting. I drove a 1969 uh, Spider once, which I believe technically falls into the Duetto lineup. That was awesome. I got a speeding sounds ticket like, in it. <laughs> yeah. That's that's an awesome story. That sounds like so much fun. I've never driven an old Alfa Romeo. Yeah. And every you know everybody that says that they that they've driven one, they just love them to death. You know, they'll say, I mean, I, 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 people will say that that is the best steering of any car I've ever driven ever bar none and it's it was an work. alfa romeo from the 60s or the 70s <laughs> they're so much affordable too you know like you could still get yeah. one the problem is is i'm not too mechanical so i mean it would cost me as much paying to keep it on the road as it does probably just to buy one uh yeah yeah the cop asked me he's like do you know how fast you were going and i looked down and the speedometer was in kilometers and broken and i said well honestly i have no idea and he was like, <laughs> well, I think I clocked you like 60 or 70 and I was in like an industrial park. So, um, that was a fun drive though. So, that's my alpha story and one of the fun mm. things you get to do in this business. Um, more forward facing, let's talk EV Bronco and EV Explorer. Explorer, I believe is like essentially like confirmed and Bronco is probably a hard maybe it sounds like. And by that, I mean, they're probably going to do that too. Uh, I read somewhere like 40% of Fords will be electric um, in the relatively near term. So, this is obviously part of the strategy. You actually wrote this story, Zach. Uh, what's your take on it? I did. So, yeah, th th this story stems from a presentation that Ford was giving uh, yesterday about their electric future in that, yes, 40% of all their vehicles sold by 2030 will be electric. Um, so, they claim right now. And during that presentation, they put up a slide of something that looks very suspiciously like an electric Bronco. Basically, uh, as, as I described the image here to you, it's the outline of a Bronco with a massive battery pack under the floor um, and spoken within context of other electric vehicles like the F-150 Lightning and the E-Transit. Uh, it really gives it away when you, you have the, the big tire hanging off the rear of the vehicle. So, what's pictured here is, you know, it's basically a Bronco. There's, there's no other vehicle from Ford that you could mistake it for. Um, and Ford also said that they're uh, moving on to electrify their icons. Now, what that means for Ford is Bronco, Bronco Sport, Mustang, um, and those, those specific vehicles. So, you read between the lines, Ford didn't actually say the words, quote, we are building an electric Bronco. They did not say that. They're just heavily suggesting that one is in the works. Um, so much so that, you know, we can be pretty safe in assuming that, you know, one day, not sure what day that will be, maybe a few years from now, maybe, maybe just two years from now. I'm not really sure. Uh, but one day there will be an electric Bronco out there. And that was pretty much the gist of it. But on top of that, uh, Ford essentially confirmed uh, this one. They did explicitly say, we will fully electrify the Ford Explorer. So, you can expect that somewhere down the road. Um, will it be on the current Explorer uh, generation? You know, could be, might not be. Um, once again, you know, we're looking at a 2030 date as, uh, you know, a, a, an outlook for at this point, 40% of our cars and the Explorer is one of Ford's biggest volume sellers. Uh, they sell around 200,000 of them a year, which is, you know, about a, about a fifth of the number of F-150s they sell for some, 
some forward volume perspective. So one day uh, the, the Explorer will also be electric. Um, and will there also be a hybrid and probably gasoline version there too? Yeah, probably. Um, it, it won't be just an electric only model uh, like, like the Mustang Mach-E is, but they're, uh, you know, in addition to your traditional uh, output uh, motivational forces, you'll have an electric one, which is, is good for everybody because everybody seems to want a three row crossover these days. That's true. That's true. Cool. So staying with Ford, the Lightning, uh, this is the, the work truck, the more like the entry level one. You know, if you look around, you saw a lot of websites pegged the starting price around 39. The actual truck probably most people would get is actually about $51,000. Still pretty reasonable for all the stuff you get. As far as just like almost like the tradesman, the work truck version, to use like, you know, Ram parlance here. Um, this is more like the, you know, the, the contractor truck. And it looks like you get a lot of stuff. Um, we got a few more details on that this week. Um, nothing really earth shattering here, but I think Ford is doing a good job of making this truck accessible at a variety of price points. And I think traditionally the very basic F-150 and Ram in particular have been two trucks you could get in very like Spartan trim that are quite good still. You know, you're making some creature comfort trade-offs, but it's still a pretty reasonable driving experience. So, yeah, you know, the the one thing that I was worried about when Ford talked about this forty thousand dollar electric F one fifty was that like. All right, so we didn't know the specs. Are they going to like make it a rear drive only? Is it going to be super down on power? Is it going to be like under 200 miles of range? Are they going to hamstring it in some some weird way that makes it so cheap? And I was pleasantly surprised Monday morning when the news dropped that no, it is not hamstrung in any way from an, an electric powertrain perspective. It's the same battery as the $52,000 truck. You know, you can get either 230 or 300 miles of range. And it's also the same pretty uh, wicked high 426 horsepower and 775 pound-feet of torque, um, which is awesome. And you can get that for, you know, the, the, the base price, which is 39000 and some change, plus I'm sure the destination charge will add another 1000 1500 to that. So you can hop into an F-150 electric, you know, for just over 40, just over $40,000. And, you know, the basics are still there, uh, which is what I think is most important when, when you're looking at this price point, you know, even, even though you, you, you do have those basics, you know, you, you have a decent interior as well, still have the 12 inch touchscreen. You know, it's not the giant 15 inch screen that you can get in the higher trims, but honestly, like the electronics are there, the capability is there. They're not like leather stitched, heated and cooled seats. They're vinyl seats, which I think a lot of people would actually be pretty cool with in a pickup if you're doing work with it. Um, and yeah, I mean, you, you can get the same maximum towing capacity up to 10,000 pounds. This truck looks like a really, really rocking deal at, uh, at at the price that you can get it in. Um, obviously, you can go as crazy as getting one for over ninety thousand dollars if you get the platinum. But you know, if if you're looking to you know buy an F one hundred and fifty, you know, and you you don't have platinum money, you can go electric for a reasonable price. And I think that that's you know that, that this is really going to hopefully cause a big sea change in what kind of pickups people buy. So. The number they're throwing at you is like thirty nine, like nine seventy four. Just reading your subhead in your story yeah. from Monday, like <laughs> that's MSRP before destination and all the stuff you actually do have to pay that makes it more like forty one. But I mean, to your point there, Zach, like not only is that a pretty good deal on an F one fifty with a lot of power, it's a pretty good deal on an electric car. You know, like electric yeah. cars are not cheap, and you're going to get that kind of range and that kind of capability i mean geez i mean like think about it you're like cross shopping capabilities with like i mean what do you get for like 41 from a tesla you know like this is i think really to use the cliche paradigm shifting you know this could really change truck buyers and i think it could also change electric vehicle buyers and i think that's actually a beautiful thing you know you're sort of taking 
politics aside, you're taking like both sides of the spectrum, if you will, and pushing them towards the middle where you're like, well, wait a minute. Jeez, this is an electric car. I get all of this for this much money. Okay, let's look at it. Or I'm a, you know, I'm a traditional truck owner, but I could get it electric and it costs this much. I mean, you're really going to win a lot of people over with this kind of, you know, price and performance. And at the end of the day, people, you know, people care about the money. <laughs> so Yeah. And we haven't even mentioned the federal EV tax credit mm -hmm. or state credits as well. That's right. If, if you live in California or Washington, Oregon, I mean, you, you'll get even more on top of the $7,500 federal. This just over $40,000 truck is now in like the low 30s, which is sort of mind blowing when it comes to, I mean, any pickup, period. You cannot, right. any full size pickup, even mid size pickups these days, something in the low 30s is oh, yeah. just like, what 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 happened? Does this truck have air conditioning and manual windows, or like why is it so cheap? So. It's a little bit of a throwback to like twenty years ago, thirty years ago, when like trucks were like the value because you would get them and they were cheaper. But you, you know, you either got like a really like a work truck or something, but you could also just get stuff on them, and they didn't really upcharge you as much, perhaps in the nineties or the eighties. You know. Um, so it's it's a little retro in that sense, and yeah, I mean it's, it seems like a screaming good deal. And I know just today there was news this morning the tax credit could get bumped to, I want to say twelve thousand five hundred or north of twelve thousand. There was um, uh, I saw a senator brought that up, and apparently it moved out of committee, so that doesn't mean it's going anywhere yet. But um, mm -hmm. they're at least talking about it, and there'd be some criteria. Like I believe it would have to be built. An electric vehicle built in the United States with like UAW workers. So that's not going to work for everything. Um, I believe the Mach E wouldn't meet that criteria, but the F 150, which is built at the Rouge factory in Dearborn, would. So, geez, you know, $12,500 off the price of that. Man, that's a good deal, you know? So you're, you're going to make me want to go put down a a reservation on one and I don't even need a pickup. It's Same. Just, it's like a I mean, steal. <laughs> at that point, you're talking about like $29,000 for, yeah, give me the home upgrade charger, you know, let's, let's go wild here, you know? So, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, that's a screaming deal. So, all right. So, that is uh, our news. You wrote a column about legalizing adaptive headlights. It took all of my... Um, you know, restraint not to put some sort of like legalized whatever in the headlines to try to, you know, bring in, I don't know, I guess whatever legalization you want to do. But um, in all seriousness, <laughs> uh, it's an interesting piece. Why don't you take us through it? Yeah. So, this this whole piece started when I drove a, uh, a 2021 Porsche 911 Turbo. It's been about a, a month since I, I drove that car now, and just like the Volkswagen Golfs that we were talking about at the start of the show, it was a European spec car from Germany, um, which means that it has the European spec headlights on it. Um, and basically, these headlights they're called adaptive driving beams, uh, as as you mentioned there in, in in the headline, Greg. And the big big feature with with these is that the brights are essentially always in an on position hmm. in that they use sensors and cameras to read the road and block out the um, you know spaces where there's a car. So if there's if if there's an oncoming car, um, you know the the actual headlight element is made up of you know over a hundred little LEDs and it basically blacks out the LEDs that would otherwise be shining in the face of that oncoming driver, uh, which allows you to keep bright level light uh, thrown at the road in front of you, beside you, to the side of that driver, um, basically everywhere except in that driver's eyes. And of course, when you have the brights on at that level, uh, you can see more, your visibility is better, uh, it's just safer to drive at night. Um, and that right there is like the one big selling point for these lights in that you can basically drive everywhere with your brights on and have that level of safety and comfort at night without blinding other people. 
the problem here uh, is that, and why I'm asking, you know, we should legalize these and that these lights are not legal in the United States yet. Um, back in 2013, Toyota petitioned NHTSA to uh, amend our regulations to allow adaptive driving beams. And we're chilling in 2021 now, and that has not yet happened. Now, the, the reason we can't have these is because our rules uh, state that you have to have basically two separate elements and nothing else for your low beams and high beams. So you have to have one element for low beams and one element for the high beams, and you can't mix like these adaptive driving beams do. It has to be either brights are on, brights are off. Um, and that right there is what's holding us back. And basically, you know, to get that changed, uh, m manufacturers have been trying for a long time now, and we just, we're just still sitting here in limbo waiting for them to come up with a final ruling to make it legal. Um, unfortunately, you know, e Europe has had this technology for, you know, going on six, seven plus years at this point. Um, and the U.S. is, you know, we, we, we have good stuff in that we have these awesome LED headlights and automatic brights. Lights are a lot better than they were 30 years ago, but, you know, they could really be a lot better than uh, even what they are today if we were to just get on it and legalize these these headlights. And honestly, there are a lot of vehicles sold today from Audi, Porsche, other European brands for the most part that actually have these lights installed in, in US spec cars. Um, and it would just take uh, the legalization of this technology for them to flip a switch on the software side of things. And you already have thousands of cars on US roads with these headlights, you know, without any development time, without, you know, product life cycles waiting two to three years for the lights to get into cars. Um, it would mostly be luxury cars at this point, but obviously if, if this tech is, is legalized, you know, then the non-luxury manufacturers will get on out to see Ford's, GM products, Stellantis, everybody will certainly get in on this because it's so much safer. Um, it's just so much better and I, uh, I feel like I've been missing out this whole time without them. And they look good too. Aesthetically, they can add a lot to a car, obviously, especially at night, but they're a nice yeah. feature. Some of the German car makers in particular uh, have done a nice job of just dressing up those headlights. Uh, I have driven this in Europe uh, a while ago, and I think they're, it's a very interesting approach. I think, um, you know, I, I hope that they can sort of get this, you know, more like this approved here, because I think American consumers would enjoy the technology. They'd probably be willing to pay for it. You know, stuff like this easily fits into like an upgraded luxury or tech package. Um, I'm curious, what do you think like the next domino to fall would need to be, if you will, to make this happen? You think it's regulatory? Yeah. You think there's a group that could maybe, you know, do some lobbying? You know, I don't know. The OEMs haven't really pushed as hard at least recently to get this over the goal line you know is there a force you think that could make this happen yeah so with this opinion piece i actually uh got in touch with a few different people who are involved in this i i contacted nitsa chatted with them did the same thing with toyota because they're the ones that initiated the whole petition here in the u.s to begin with um and right now um nitsa has a proposed rule change out there. And, and so they, they, they were basically saying, okay, yes, um, we see that you want this changed um, and we're, we're okay that you want this changed. Um, but there are some regulatory, uh, I guess, roadblocks from the administration uh, that, that they'll have to get through. Basically, it's, it's I, I don't want to say that it is political, but uh, from what NHTSA told me was, and, and from what Toyota told me, uh, there was supposed to be a final ruling made by the previous administration, the Trump administration. That never happened. Um, and now it's up to the Biden's administration, Biden's NHTSA, uh, you know, the people that they appoint and the people within NHTSA to actually come to an agreement and say, yes, these are available and then actually amend the rules. 
Um, they have the power to do that. It's not like there's any bill that needs to get passed through Congress or anything like that. Um, there's just a, a massive set of rules of the road um, that that you have to go through. And when that gets done, you know, we're not really sure. I asked Toyota if they like had any sort of a timetable and they were just like, we honestly don't know. Um, they actually asked me uh, because they were like, oh, you're, you're looking into this with with NHTSA, let us know if, if you hear anything. Um, because clearly they, they are hoping to find, or hear some information and they just have not heard anything yet. Um, but it looks promising as though there could be something on the horizon, maybe within the next year, maybe within the next two years. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's been eight years now since Toyota has originally petitioned and there's still no movement, which is, you know, very classic, slow government, government runs slow. <laughs> I can tell you so. this. I have covered NHTSA under four different administrations. And the one takeaway ha I have is they do not move quickly. Um, yeah. So, uh, check out the story. It's a really nice piece. Uh, it went up last week, actually. Uh, it's on, obviously, on Autoblog. If you're looking for some, you know, weekend reading, uh, search it out. It's a good read. Uh, and let's uh, move on to, we'll spend some money, but first let's go to the mailbag here real quick. We have an update uh, from the Spend My Money from just last week, episode 679. Uh, this came from Wayne in Portland. Uh, listen to the pod. Thanks for the suggestions. This was, uh, let's see, the gentleman who was looking to replace uh, his Wrangler uh, that I believe was uh, totaled. So, here's basically the update. Full disclosure, we already bought the Gladiator Rubicon in Snazberry Pearl before I sent the email. So essentially what he was trying to do is see if we like concurred with what he did. And hey, that's cool. I appreciate that. Um, so uh, basically wanted to see if um, we agreed or if, you know, should go kick himself and, you know, see if there was something they didn't think of. So, uh, they're going to do some camping adventures and they're doing some, looks like they're working on a build out for that. So, that's cool. Uh, he threw in some pictures of the Wrangler, which was uh, nicknamed Smoochie, pre-accident. And the Gladiator is, uh, looks like Aquila in its current state. So, some cool car nicknames. It's good to name your car. Have you ever named any of your cars, Zach? No, I have not actually. I, so, I, I guess the, the, the closest thing to a name with my Integra I sometimes refer to it as the Teggy, mm, okay. um, but it's not. It's not like I've I've given it a name like Steve or something like that. Got it. <laughs> so I just sort of handed it that nickname and uh, sort of roll with it. Sometimes call it the Integra. Sometimes call it Teggy. Either okay. one works. All right. Well, fair enough. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, let's see. They the short list was a new Wrangler, a used Wrangler, a new Gladiator, or a new Bronco. They got the Gladiator. Uh, the Wrangler was just, it was tough to kind of buy a Wrangler after they wrecked the Wrangler, a little bit of scar tissue. Uh, Bronco would have been higher up, except uh, it sounds like the waiting list was uh, until next year and they didn't want to miss the camping season. Of course, the Bronco, I don't believe is actually on sale right now either. So, there's that. That's the large Bronco, not the Bronco Sport, which if you live anywhere in Michigan, they're literally on every corner. It seems like everybody used their employee discount to go get a Bronco Sport. They are everywhere. But yeah, fair point. If you want the, uh, the actual Bronco, you got to wait for it. Um, basically, thought, uh, let's see, the Synchro suggestion was fantastic though. Uh, both Wayne and his wife have been into VWs for the last 20 plus years. Uh, let's see, he owns a 1990 Corrado, very cool. And she owns a 2003 20th anniversary uh, GTI, 20th anniversary edition GTI. That's pretty neat. Um, so, you know, they were into some of Jeremy's uh, uh, VW van suggestions. So, so basically, um, sounds like we did a good job on that one, I'd say. So thanks for writing and thanks for listening, Wayne. Uh, try to condense that letter. Hope I didn't uh, butcher it up too much. But um, yeah, that was uh, that's the update. Should we spend some more money? 
Let's spend some more money. Yeah, right. looks like it's a similar uh, off roady yeah. uh, theme this week too. Exactly. All right, here. So scrolling down here, uh, looking for some help spending some money on a new larger vehicle for a growing family. Uh, the first baby is coming in September. Congratulations! They live in Georgia and they're looking for a car they could commute in a short city commute and then use for regular weekend use uh, in some long family trips up the East Coast. Sounds like a good good time. Right now, they have a 99 Wrangler uh, that they are looking to replace. Uh, my guess is that experience is probably a little ragged at this point. You probably don't want to do too much commuting in a 99 Wrangler, uh, although if it's short, you're probably all right. Uh, his wife has a 2019 Subaru Outback. That's a company car. They can both drive it, but it's not really a permanent solution. It makes a lot of sense there. So, um, let's see, he references the, uh, the minivan discussion from a couple of weeks ago. But they don't want that, fair enough. Uh, so they're looking to replace it with another boxy SUV, modern and safe. Budget is up to around 60 grand. The front runner is the new Defender 110. Uh, but they're saying finding the something closer to the stock version they like and could afford is nearly impossible. I agree with that. I uh, drove a Defender last fall, and it's an interesting vehicle because the price point is there's a lot of price points. Let's put it that way. So um, let's see, they've looked at newer, slightly used Forerunners. Uh, other options are wait for the new Forerunner, whenever that might come out, or the Rivian R1S. Thoughts or other suggestions? I think I know what I'm going to go with here, but uh, Zach, I'll kick it over to you. What do you think? Yeah, man. So I have not driven uh, the new Land Rover Defender. Um, I have heard some really good things about it from everybody that has driven it. Um, and I, I do think that it is a strong front runner, uh, to have there, you know, it's, it's a family vehicle. It's going to be uh, semi luxurious. Um, you know, even if you do get one that is around $60,000, it's, it's going to be pretty nice. Um, but you know, it's, it's also probably not going to be, you know, the vehicle that you might want to keep for, 10 years or something like that. It's, it's probably not going to be uh, shiny and new and great and super reliable that entire time. Um, if, you know, recent Land Rovers are any, any indication as to where, where this one is going to. Um, maybe if you're looking for something, you know, briefer out there, it's something like three or four years, uh, just, just keep it under warranty. Um, then that would be a really good choice. However, uh, Honestly, your your second option there with the Forerunner uh, would probably be my number one pick. Uh, you can go and get something super cool like a TRD Pro. You can get a Forerunner TRD Pro uh, with your sixty thousand dollar budget. Um, you can actually be slightly under budget there. Outfit it with some some cool aftermarket stuff if if that's the way that you want to go. It's going to be wildly reliable. Keep all of its value. Uh, probably just like your 1999 Wrangler uh, is probably retaining far more value than uh, than you might expect it to be, um, and and it's a Toyota, so you know you're. I know as of late, you know they've even updated the Forerunner with you know a massive suite of uh, Toyota driver assistance systems. Um, you can get adaptive cruise control, lane departure alert, um, that that whole grab bag of stuff. And if you like cool colors, they can give you a really cool color with the Forerunner as well. Um, as for waiting, you know, you, you mentioned those those long shot options. I would not bet on a new Forerunner coming uh, anytime soon within the time period that you want it. Um, I, I know that I, I haven't seen any rumors or any any reports about a, a new one coming soon. And then the Rivian. Uh, Tough to recommend that one as well, because once again, I, I, I have never driven it. Um, but if, if you're looking at EVs, that seems to be, you know, the one if you want something that is uh, big, off-road capable, and also can seat a lot of people. There really aren't any other options coming anytime soon. So, Forerunner, number one pick, I think, for me. Uh, seems like a great, you know, cool family vehicle. Uh, that uh, is not going to blow blow your budget out either. Yeah, um, same. That's I, I actually kicked it over to you because I wanted to see if you might go with something different than the Forerunner. But I like the Defender. It's it's you know 
For $60,000, you could get a pretty nice one. And I feel like in some of the more basic trims, it doesn't quite stand out as much as it does once you really dress it up. You get like the two-tone paint and the cool wheels. Uh, but honestly, I've driven them both. The Defender is a more modern vehicle. It's, you know, it's a Land Rover as opposed to a Toyota. So there's certainly some brand, you know, cachet there. But at the end of the day, for the budgets all the way up to 60 grand, you can get the top forerunner and still have almost 10 grand to spend on just some accessories. And I still, this is very like almost like an emotional like logic here. I like the forerunner better. I love the forerunner. I think it's a lot of fun to drive. I love how it looks. It's a little old school. It's a lot old school. Haven't heard about really any new forerunners on the horizon. So, you know, when you yeah. said that, my first thought was, wait, what's going on? Is there a new forerunner coming? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean, even just sketch it out the, the trims here. TRD Pro starts at 57.45, add some destination, and you're probably still looking at 52, 53. Um, I would that you just want to spend the best forwarder you got. That's cool. I, you know, the limited, I don't really, that's not the look I want for a forerunner, just as I'm going through here. I would probably drop back down to like a venture special edition, which comes with the uh the Yakima cargo basket, which is kind of neat. Um and even in base trim, you know, $38,000 Forerunner or just a simple TRD off-road premium at 43, not including destination charges, you're getting a lot of SUV there. You're getting a lot of off-roader uh, for your money and you're getting a pretty cool look. So I would definitely say Forerunner, um, you know, maybe go drive a Defender and it might be the kind of vehicle that you fall in love with. And in, in, if that's the case, then that's the car for you. I mean, it's... You know, carbine can be a very um, like evocative experience. Uh, it can be emotional, but I mean, that's where I would land. Is I would do Forerunner. So yeah, yeah. You know, there's there's one other. You know, if if you are willing to wait, because it, it does look like you know maybe wait for a new Forerunner or the Rivian R1S. Um, I don't know how long you'd have to wait at this point because there are a lot of pre-orders, but the Bronco four door, yeah, as well. Uh, you know, you're you're ditching a Wrangler, so you're ditching a vehicle that is you know a bit of a rock crawler, really really good off road. Um, mm-hmm. The four runner will definitely be a little more practical than a Bronco. I am I'm I'm guessing, but you know you can you can get a almost like a the, the, the Broncos are so much more modern than than the four runner. You get so many more tech features. Um, things that are probably going to be better for a family lifestyle as well. Um, so if if you are willing to wait and you are willing to most likely pay more than you're paying for the four runner, then uh, you know maybe maybe check out that four door Bronco when they eventually hit hit the dealers later this year. Yeah, that's a great point. Like if you are willing to like wait for the Rivian, I would also wait for the Bronco if you will, as far as just yeah. looking at time frames. Um, Rivian might be cool, but to your point there, Zach, who knows, you know, I mean, I, I don't think I'd be waiting on what's still essentially a startup car company to deliver yeah. my next car if I needed it anytime soon. Um, so yeah, uh, Bronco, but I would still lead towards Forerunner just as far as, you know, you want to go camping this summer, head down to your local Toyota dealership and I think you'll get set up right away. You know, if you're willing to play the waiting game. Uh, absolutely. That Bronco is going to be cool too, though. So, yeah, cool. So that's all the time we have this week. Uh, check out, uh, our Volkswagen Golf R and GTI stories. Uh, when you're listening to this in the future, send us your spend my buddies or any other questions you have. We love doing a mailbag and we've been able to do it the last couple of weeks. Thanks to user participation. So that's podcast at autoblog.com. Be safe out there. Have a great holiday and we will see you next week.